I'm Mark Z, and you're watching Thorin, the best interviewer behind Travis Gafford. Doublelift has won the Most Valuable Player Award for Season 8, the NALCS Summer Split, and quite frankly, absolutely deserved. He is the best player on the best team in the NALCS. Remember, this is an award only for the regular split. That's the usual criteria people use to decide the MVP, quite frankly, in traditional sports from about the 1980s onwards. People don't pick just whoever the best in the whole league is. Not that that wouldn't apply to doublelift in this instance. So it's consistent with what people generally use as the criteria. Although we've had instances in the past, like Arrow on P1. And I think another example would probably be... Um, let me think. I think you've got to go with like Rush on tip. Yeah, you know, sure, these are a bit wacky by that criteria, but people generally stick to this criteria. So based on that criteria, he's the MVP. I personally think it was very clear cut in his team, which was the best, that if you're going to pick someone, it had to be double lift. He is one of the only primary win conditions in almost every single game, not just when they were playing funnel, but obviously at that point in time. Generally, it is a team with supportive elements, which are structured to play around him as the star player, as the key figure. He is is the primary carry of the team and that's actually notable in itself because he's playing with players where minus Pobelter they are all players who have been the best in their role in the NALCS at some point in time impact during his cloud nine days when he was absolutely the best tank player when it was the tank meta you think of Ick Smithy it's been a fabulous player when he was in Immortals when he was in CLG now when he's been in 100 Thieves Obviously, all year during his time in Immortals, people were saying in that summer split, perhaps he should have been the MVP at certain points in times because he was carrying the inexperienced Cordy Son and then generally the team as a heavy playmaker. So to be the best in that kind of a cast and the clear cut best, that's pretty impressive stuff. I think, again, if you're going to pick someone from that team, it doubles the only one you can really pick. Then he's the best at his role, and actually, quite frankly, by a large margin. Who else in an NLCS really can match up there as an AD carry? I mean, Cody Sun was supposed to be an average to above average AD carry, according to some people. That guy couldn't even play in the semis because his own team wanted him taken out. So I think that shows right there that unless you've got some world-class AD carry, you are going to be in a disadvantage in the bot lane when you go against, 100, uh, against Team Liquid and double lift. Also, you've got to consider, even the AD carry he's facing in the final, Sneaky, was actually benched from his team for some of the games and wasn't always used for particular tactical reasons. No one's going to be benching double if they're taking him out of the match. Taylor Rickard wouldn't win games if he did that. I will say, on one level, I think it is a slightly hard call to decide the MVP because, again, remember, we're only talking about the regular season. Do not think of anything that happened in the playoffs, including 100 Thieves playing Team Liquid, because that is irrelevant in the playoffs. It's also irrelevant, by the way, that in the regular season, Team Liquid had a winning record over 100 Thieves. It's about how you played against the entire league. That's what the MVP award is of the regular split. So in that context, personally, I actually don't know that I would have voted for double FTS. So if I'd have had an MVP vote... I'd have to go back and watch some of the last games of 100 Thieves where they were losing a bunch of them. But for most of the split, I'd say like a solid three quarters of the split, I personally thought someday was the MVP. Like, admittedly, it's a bit unfair in as much as it's because of like kind of like uh, Rush when he won with Tip. It's how much he was carrying a team that I thought really wasn't as good as it was, as its record was at one point in time where they were top of the league and then top two. Like, I actually think where they ended up overall placing was really more where they were as an actual team. It's just someday was the reason why they were able to get potentially a top seed until they blew it at the end of the season. He was so good when he got to carry. He was unbelievable. So far ahead of all the other top laners in the league. Then as a low econ player, again, he was probably the best tank player in the league but like classic season five kt rolster where he was going to the finals with them this guy would play low econ and a tank not get jungle pressure and still carry the whole fucking game doing that as well like it's guy was unbelievable so i will say you could definitely provoke an interesting discussion with me about should we give mvp awards to people who aren't always the main carry focus of a team or Aren't the ones, like if you're just playing a tank, no matter how amazingly you play that tank, 
Can you really be the tr true carry of the team? Were you really the best player of the team, the MVP of the team? That's tough to say. Like, I do kind of feel like things like MVP awards are really for the best players. And so even though I personally would say overall, and obviously top lane doesn't carry all the time, I think someday was the best top laner by far in NLCS. But was he the best player in the whole league? I think it's debatable. And so if you're going to add in criteria, like you have to have your team plays very well, then yeah, Doublelift gets it. And Doublelift was the primary carry the whole time and his role allows him to carry. So, okay, it's a tough one. Put it that way. I could really be swung either way or not. I don't mind double if winning. I think he certainly was one of the best. I personally probably would have gone for someday. But again, I think you'd have to review the games. This is, I'm not voting for MVP. That's not something I went and did, quite frankly. Then you've got to add in, go to the 100 Thieves side. I don't think they were even that good a team. I think they got by on having someday carry practically all the time, even when on tanks. They had some good macro in the mid game if they got there, presumably from Afromu, last splits MVP. But beyond that, I don't think they had a whole, whole lot. Obviously, by for most of the split, they didn't even have a really like a, a anywhere close to a high level jungler. The AD carry was decent, but prone to mistakes in big games. And the mid laner, yeah, he's solid enough, but we know he can't com perfectly. And he's never going to be a, a dominant carry mid laner or insane smash the lane threat as a mid. So I think it was all about someday that they even had a chance to be a viable team that could have even gone to the finals here. Now, I do think one of the things that's notable about Doublelift winning this award is I do like it in as much as for his legacy, it would be a tragedy if this guy finished his NALCS career without a minimum of one MVP award. Like, I actually think if you go back over the splits, I think he was the MVP of, of at least one split in the past, maybe even two. So even though I hate that as a reason to give someone an award now, like, for example... I think it was debatable as to whether Kobe Bryant was the 2008 MVP. I think you could really have made a good case for LeBron James and for Chris Paul. But the reason Kobe Bryant absolutely won the MVP that split at season is because that was the first season where he had an elite team again. And so when he'd been the best player in the NBA for the last three, four, five years, it didn't matter because his team wasn't the best and wasn't getting high placings. So by that old traditional sports media criteria that they thought up in the NBA for the last 20, 25 years, at that point in time, yeah, he, he was the MVP and they sort of gave it to him because even if he wasn't the clear-cut best player, it was a way to make up seemingly for past errors in him never having won an MVP. And obviously he never would have won an MVP if he hadn't have got it then. So for that logic, yeah, obviously I like that double if wins it. I don't personally like that logic generally, but then again, he got robbed in some splits in the past. So sorry someday. I mean, maybe your time comes in the future when you get a really good team. I think it's kind of fucked up, but you know, you've got to take it into consideration. Personally, I think Doublelift should have, this should be either his second or his third MVP. The one that stands out very clearly in my mind is, listen, I'm a big fan of Bjergsen. I think he's an amazing player. But I think if you go back to summer 2016, I think he was playing much more conservative and he was in no way the super carry that he was in season four, summer, in season five for the entire year. I think that's when, Double, when Bjergsen is your MVP of the league. Season... Uh, Six summer, when TSM just dominates the whole league, Doublelift's the best player on that team. He's the main carry. He's the one outclassing his lane opposition the most. So for me, that should have been a Doublelift MVP. And that was the one where Bjergsen won it by 117 ballot points to 106. And Doublelift actually got 17 first place votes. So Bjergsen did indeed get more. And obviously that was one of the years where a bunch of idiot fucking coaches and media people just like did troll votes or silly votes that were like, why is a caster voting for this player as like a top three player? So I called him out on a video on it at the time from memory and it was quite bullshit. And that might indeed have affected who ended up winning overall. Summer 2015, the year before, funnily enough, all summer splits that he seems to be an MVP candidate. I also think you could have argued when he was with CLG that he was the best player in the league. He was the best player on that team, hard carry candidate. I guess the problem is he played with Afromu, so some people didn't know how much to take away from that. Whereas if you're just a mid laner or a top laner or a jungler, you play by yourself to some degree. And so people can see, oh yeah, he's dominating, he's better than the rest. So I think that's part of the reason. And people had no faith in CLG going in the playoffs at that point in time. So I think he also could have won it then. So this could have been his third MVP, which I think would be much more in line with his status and his dominance in his position as a player in the NALCS. He's someone where he's a guy who was very good even before that. I mean, I think if you go to season four, you look at the spring and the summer. This is a guy where with Aframu, they were the best bot lane in the league. I don't care who you're going to pick and put against them. They were the best in the league. It's just that their team famously chalked, could never make it deep in the playoffs. I mean, they got to the semis of that spring split, but 
they, they were never going to win. And so unfortunately, it was going to be a Bjergsen, a High, someone from a Cloud9 or a TSM who were going to win these awards. It wasn't going to, oh, Zhao Wei Zhao, you know, these sorts of players, it wasn't going to be a double if like people didn't give him the credit because his team was losing him. And I thought they were amazing. And by the way, I think it says a lot that those two players, double if and Afromu, are your two MVPs for season eight, four seasons later. I mean, it really makes you wonder, considering how good they were in a team that wasn't that great, Think about what they could have, in light of performance, had some good players of it. Think about what they could have accomplished if they could have stuck together. If they could have gone to a top team as a, a like, a, like a Sven Mithy type package deal and they were playing right now. I mean, imagine them right now if they were the fucking Team Liquid bot lane. That'd be straight fire. Anyway, then you've got to think about the fact that this is someone where you give him quality, proven teammates, not teammates that are good or have the potential to be or are good in the regular season. Players who can perform at all times, like he's got now. He's got a great team built around him, just as he did in TSM. And he's shone so brightly since then. So the idea was just him and he was the one playing worse. I don't buy it. I don't buy the idea he like leveled up his IQ 100 points going from CLG and putting on a TSM jersey like some people like to spin it. No, he was always a very good player. He needed a certain mentality of teammate and quality of teammate in some cases. CLG had some good lineups. They never had like the best players at each position. They only had close to that as far as I'm concerned. He never had a legit other carry threat to play with him in most of those lineups. Then... You've got to look at the fact that he's turned his whole story around and in such sick fashion. This is a guy now who already has four LCS titles. This is someone who, let me think, is that right? Yes, he already has four LCS titles with three different teams, no less. If he wins his fifth on Sunday, that ties Bjergsen. Bjergsen was way ahead of people like Doublelift in terms of titles, one, etc. So the fact that he gets an MVP now, that's nice. That starts to level that gap up. He's already been in six NA LCS finals. Again, this is a guy where for the first two and a half years of the LCS, he never was in a final. Now he's already been in six, including this one. He's already made it to Worlds. So this is going to be his fifth Worlds appearance out of eight seasons. All of a sudden, now he has the legendary resume, decorated career, accomplishments, championships, titles, finals, appearances, top fours, everything you'd need to be a legendary player. And he had all the talent and the, the ability and performance to do that. The first part of this LCS, but what a turnaround this last half, this last two thirds of his career has been. It's been fantastic to watch. And so his legacy, I think now is getting the accolades it has always deserved because he is one of the most domestically dominant players we've ever seen in League of Legends. And there have been very few in NALCS history who could even measure up to him, and especially now with these kind of accomplishments. So I think well-deserved. Glad to see him win one at last, the MVP of Season 8 Summer. This video was kindly supported by Gardner Wilson, Dean Tanglis, Alex Adams, Eddie Wingfors, Andreas Snazor Westerland, God Awful Waste of Space, Kyla Harris, Travis Greb, James Harding, Daniel Yordanov, Vexi, Robert Baxter, and a special thanks goes out to Jerky's Minion. Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest to appear in my content? Do you want to ask me a question in my monthly AMA? Do you want teasers for upcoming content and guests? Want to take part in a discussion about esports with me? Put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today. Link in the description box.